Hello again for another Archaeology Coffee Hour. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you to Joe Tiffany for um, answering my request to do this interview. And he'll be interviewed by Cherie Hari Arts, who works at the Office of the State Archaeologist. With the other programs, you can type in a question or a comment into YouTube or Facebook, and we'll get to those questions towards the end of the program. So I am going to disappear and leave it to Cherie and Joe. Well, I'll introduce Joe. Um, I got to know him a uh, long time ago when uh, I was a graduate student at the University of Kansas and I joined the Plains Anthropological Society and started going to the Plains conferences um, where Joe was already a mover and shaker there. He was uh, president of the organization. <laughs> um, and he led field trips and uh, gave papers, and we learned so much from hanging around with him. And uh, the main thing I remember is it was always a really good time. He wasn't uh, intimidating. We always uh, learned a lot and had a lot of fun. Uh, You're a glare there. <laughs> uh, so anyway, I'll introduce Joe. Um, do you want to introduce yourself? Tell us about your background or how you got started How'd you first get hooked on archaeology? How did I first get hooked on archaeology? Well, I was in the fifth grade. Uh, we had uh, old textbooks that were brought in when the school district was consolidated in the 30s. And one of them was a world history textbook from, you know, 1925. There was a page in there that had one of the wing bulls from Nippur. Uh -huh. went, I've got to see that. But I did. <laughs> I did. I was 20 oh. when I got to the British Museum to see it. But anyway, it goes it goes goes back a long way. So let's put it that way. So, so you started on the plains then? When you started uh, in Iowa, basically. Um, where did I go? First dig was in Glenwood. Okay. Working, working for Adrian Anderson, uh, a DOT uh, related project, a site on US 34 called the Lincoln One uh, House Site. So worked there, and then the field school was that summer, again back in Glenwood, and then where'd I go? Around back there <laughs> another year. And <laughs> Glenwood lasted a long time. There. It lasted close to forever. Um, <laughs> then after that, I went to uh, graduate school. So I did. Uh, where was that? University of Wisconsin Madison. So there you are. <laughs> worked in Wisconsin briefly, then back out on the plains to uh, North Dakota and uh, a little bit Nebraska. Then uh, came back to Iowa and worked here in the state archaeologist's office for uh, almost 11 years. There are now employees here, folks, that have surpassed my tenure at this place by <laughs> three generations. But at the time, it was uh, seemed like a long time. Then I took off for California. and. Oh. Uh, I didn't know about your California sojourn. Oh, yeah. I was a, uh, associate dean for uh, uh, at Cal Poly Pomona, one of the cool. famous ag schools in the CSU system, um, as opposed to the country club that was Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, yeah. <laughs> that place. Anyway, uh, so I did California contract work, uh, ran a couple of field schools. Then what I do? Came back to Iowa State, uh, uh, gaggle of graduate students and I uh, fired up the old Iowa State Archaeological Laboratory. The grad uh, grad world started. Uh, did contracted work there. Wrote <laughs> reports, wrote stuff. Got myself tenured again. Don't ever do that, folks. <laughs> oh, too old. Anyway, then uh, uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Jim Thieler, enticed me up to University of Wisconsin La Crosse, uh, where I became executive director of the Mississippi Valley Archaeology Center, University of Wisconsin La Crosse. That, yeah. And I did that and taught archaeology until I quit. <laughs> <laughs> retired. Oh, retired. Yeah, retired. Yeah. So. When they hired me, there's a, there's a sociology, archaeology faculty, and they're all sitting around. Of course, none of them ask appropriate questions. And one of them was, well, 
how long are you going to stay? And I point at Theo. He goes, I go. <laughs> <laughs> that puts the pressure on. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, so that's kind of a, the loop de loose story. Uh, here, there, up, down. You've covered a lot of ground, too. Uh, what's your favorite site? My I mean, I, no, I was just going to say, I associate you with a lot of. Plains Village, mm -hmm. late prehistoric stuff, and and pottery, and uh, they're all they're all pretty cool. Uh, Bagnall site in North Dakota. Um, a colleague of mine and I, uh, I, he'd come up, volunteered. We were working on this site. And Chip says, "What's this?" And I said, "Well, it's what's left of the cover of the cash bin. There's hide and you know." Cool. cool. Yeah. You know, um, preservation's actually, good up there. Preservation's very good. There are stumps of posts still in the post holes. Uh, it was, it was a riot. Absolute yeah. riot. Uh, Amazing. Well, there's a lot of sites like that, but that one in particular was loads of fun. Hmm. And you know, I don't know, mighty Chinyata, uh but Dwayne Anderson was state archaeologist. He and I, you know, paddled around the state, uh, did several different sites. I mean, they're all interesting. I want to say that, well, some of them weren't. When you don't find anything, but most of them are, <laughs> most of them are pretty interesting. So, so do you consider pottery to be? I know that's what I think of when I think of you as all your. Um, well, I got. Uh, I, I kind know of, you've done lots of others. I kind of fell into that, so uh, I guess that's. That's my shtick at the current time. It was time. one of those somebody had to do it. <laughs> yeah, well, I just uh, finishing up a report on the FIP site, which uh, I'll never do again. But um, it uh, reminded me of things that I'd forgotten and, and things that need to be changed. And you know what? It's going to be somebody else that does them. It can't be me. But uh, it was kind of fun to do at least one more big collection again so you're still working on the um the glenwood stuff too the <laughs> <laughs> my chapter was done in 2008 there we go <laughs> the record show no uh, we did uh, the the wall ridge site is actually going to come out any day and that, oh that's right uh -huh. uh, that's steve lensick shirley and i edited that wrote some chapters the one that's still laying out there in the weeds is the US 34 project, which is a write up of 18 uh, Glenwood Lodge sites that were found. One of them, was, I, I mentioned, was uh, the Lincoln One site, ML 119, 18 lodge site write ups that have been kind of waiting for a complete report. There were dissertations, they're all authority. I mean, there's lots of stuff out there, but Never looked at it comprehensively. It's never kind of got pull the, it all together. Yeah. Never got the report that you would expect now for a, a data recovery project. So, and we're working on that. Me, Steve, Mike, Perry. Not necessarily in that order. <laughs> <laughs> no, that that's really cool. That that uh, people who have the institutional knowledge and uh, the background. I mean, I would have to start out rereading all of that material in order to go it's, through with it. It's one of those things that, you know, no report ever comes out before it's time. It's like the old, uh, uh, who was that? Orson Welles. <laughs> anyway, the, uh, uh, the fact that we're doing it now with computerized and GIS modeling, uh, data assembly, uh, Excel. I mean, there was none of this stuff existed when we started this. Okay. It actually makes for a much, much better report. Uh, houses now can be correctly oriented, where before they're just kind of slapped on the map with, you know, yeah. oh, that looks like north, put it that way. Uh, now they're fixed. So there's a lot of data that even in the published material was never really put on the maps. So that's just one little aspect of things that are going on. Yeah, the computer has let you handle so much data. You could create huge tables and really get some summary yeah. statistics and things. I forget one of the tables I was working with, Steve. It was like, you know, it wasn't into the triple alphabet, but it was like, you know, 50, <laughs> 50 lines, 50 columns across, you know. 
and you can do that. You can close them down, clack them up. So, so. Yeah, so, sort and thing. Yeah. Chaniana was all by hand, folks. So. <laughs> I remember the calculator doing... going down, adding stuff up, checking again, checking a third time. And trying to get them to oh, the third time doesn't agree with the first one. And Yeah, well, that still occurs with the computers when you got somebody like me operating it. But medicine right. Oh, I say I put the wrong information. <laughs> <laughs> At least you don't have to add it all up individually anymore. That is correct. I, I've been trying what, to. Uh, what was that beep? Your beep? Um, I think it sounds probably somebody just got some email or something. It's, oh, it's, boy. <laughs> oh. oh, so. Um, is that? Uh, yeah, uh, that was. Uh, I spent a. Uh, summer semester at Oxford and uh, visited sites in uh, England, France. I did a field school in the Inner Hebrides. Ooh, cool. Very cool. Uh, loads, loads of fun. Do that when you're young, when you're 20. That's the time to do that. <laughs> oh, too late. Oh, no. <laughs> Hitch, hitchhiked all over England. I mean, I can't imagine myself doing that now. Just cannot. <laughs> Eiffel Tower, don't go up there. <laughs> <laughs> they, I, they may have automated things since 1970, but you, you went up on a gravity feed elevator two thirds of the way up, then stepped over and got on the other elevator and went to the top. And when you step out, you're a thousand feet in the air and there's a little guardrail and a brass plate to step on to the next elevator. <laughs> clinging to the scaffolding. <laughs> well, that's, that's the joke. I get in the other elevator, I put my hand on the rails, and it was hot. <laughs> <laughs> the death grip. <laughs> the death grip, too, you know. So anyway, it's fun to have adventures like that. So um, what else did they do in England? All kinds of, you know, sites, museums, um, some sites we've revisited, and then when I was at Lacrosse, I ran what they called uh, the London tour, which was a uh, spring break where we took over a gaggle of unsuspecting students <laughs> <laughs> uh, to London. Uh, I gave them a tour of the, of the town, uh, museums, sent them to a play. We sent them to the opera if there was one available, but. You know, you go to London, it's the capital, the theater capital of the world. I kept telling him, you can't go here and not go to a play. <laughs> oh, smack you. Anyway. <laughs> uh, You're going to get educated. <laughs> yeah, but we uh, we visited a lot of sites uh, that I had seen years ago and went back again. Stonehenge, Avebury. Um, what was another one? Oh, uh, West Kent, Long Barrow. Uh, just cool sites. And some of them have not changed, as you might imagine, but some have. You can't get up to Stonehenge anymore. Oh, yeah. When I, when I was there, you just want to write in, get a spray can, and write your name on it. <laughs> Which is probably what happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah or but, people. Uh, uh, but lots of things to do. New so, Age Druids. <laughs> New Age Druids. Uh, one place we took them was Salisbury Cathedral uh, because the old uh, hill fort there, old Serum. Uh, which still has the remnants of a of a Norman castle, set in the middle of a Iron Age hill fort. I mean, they were that blew them away. This was dug by hand. Yes, <laughs> by hand. so and old old Saren's important too because um, William Pitt, uh, when he was prime minister and a, a member of parliament, represented Old Sarum, not Salisbury. Old Sarum. <laughs> A goat herd, two little kids, and a bunch of sheep. That was his entire <laughs> the crew. <laughs> that was that's who voted for him, you know. So anyway. They also there's other stuff there too, but you know, uh get off the subject. Back to <laughs> back to biz. I'm just ba babbling <laughs> away babbling away here. Oh, that's what a conversation's all that's what it's for. Um yeah, come come. We come back to the plains. I feel like I followed you around the Great Plains. Every time I got there, you weren't there anymore. <laughs> yes. We went up to North Dakota, and and when we got to Iowa, you were up in in uh, Wisconsin already. Yep. Well, North Dakota is a good place for archaeology, don't you think? 
Oh yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a nasty climate come January, but uh, I the, tried not to be there in January, folks. I, that, that, that was clever. <laughs> <laughs> we weren't that clever. <laughs> Um, but uh, out in the western part of the state, the preservation is so good. There's still standing timber lodges and teepee rings visible on on the surface. And uh, yeah, it would be st uh, staggering um, for people to actually see that stuff. The last real time I was out there, I was working with a colleague at uh, Augustana College. We had a, a Bureau of Indian Affairs contracted work to uh, fix the, the highway that ran down one side of the Missouri, uh, the regraded, that sort of thing. So there's a little bit of archaeology to do. We hit two or three extended uh, coalescent earth lodges. Uh, those are kind of scary, folks, because uh, that was right when the disease hit the middle of Missouri Valley. And those, and oh my God. Smallpox. Yeah, um, there are these big storage pits with people laid in them one on top of the other, just stacked them in there like cordwood. Yeah. It's such a sad story. It is. But the good story was uh, Lake Francis case was down to the Missouri Valley. I mean, there was no reservoir there. And you could drive along and see all these sites, Talking Crow, all of them were just sitting there. Because of the weather? The, the no, water the water. Was, yeah. The water, the water's, the water's down. The water's down. So can, uh, that was pretty cool. So seeing sites that had not been seen for for, for a long time a long time that's right i remember seeing you know scapula hose washed up on the shores of those reservoirs and uh, uh, at, uh another uh bagnell site story one of the workers was way down in one of these you know eight foot deep bell shaped storage pits and all you had to take a letter to get down into it all you can see was his arm coming up Setting up scapula hose. You know. <laughs> Here comes another one. And then it got real quiet for a while. Uh, the person in charge was the late Don Lemer. Uh, anyway, he, uh, Don's sitting there. We're talking. The kid comes up and he has a section, a right angle section of an elk antler that still had the uh, end scraper. Hafted into it. Hafted yeah. to it. And he says, hey, Don, we keeping these? <laughs> <laughs> is this important? <laughs> Lieber jumped him. Anyway, uh, can't mention what Don said, but you know, it was anyway, every day up there, lots of stuff to see, things to do. Um, everyone should get a chance to work on a site with area that has that kind of preservation. Oh, yeah. I, I remember you said, you said there's a little bit of archaeology to do, just three or four earth lodges. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Shovel those out in an afternoon. No, we did not. We don't do that. So. Yeah. Then you have to deal with all the data. There's a lot of information. There. Oh, my gosh. Uh, if those sites were excavated uh, on the river basin surveys projects the way we do now, it would fill up this building, it'd fill up two or three buildings. I mean, it just, you can't imagine the amount of stuff that's on these sites. And uh, well, I've seen the pictures with like mounds of bone that yep. just, just piled up and they were like, yeah, yeah, that was in the way. So we yeah, just threw that over there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and bones are what I like. So I, well, a, lot of, a lot of people, <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> a lot of people like bones, you know, and, uh, they, they kept the big pieces. I'll, I'll say that, but they were under, <laughs> they're under a lot of pressure. To get those, uh, this is the late 60s for those folks out there who know what's going on time-wise. But When they built that whole chain of reservoirs, it runs through. they were finally the filling the reservoirs along the Missouri, and uh, there was very little time, and it was truly salvage archaeology. It was, uh, they did the best they could with the time they had and the money available. But uh, the tragedy of this is nobody's ever been back, really ever been back Uh I think a talking crow comes to mind. Uh, Stan Ayler and others went went back to that. That did that one right. Uh -huh. uh, so it's not like it's been totally abandoned. But how many uh, how many Plains Village archaeologists are there on the plains now? Um, uh, I can't quote you the number. I should uh, just for membership for the from the society. I'm about, thinking there's. Go ahead. 
No, I said I was going to say I want to say four hundred or something, but I'm probably getting it wrong. Oh, that's that's including all of them. I mean, how many people? Yeah. Have, how many work on Plains Village sites? sites? Oh, yeah, no, that not that many. And Ray Woods dead. So it's down to three. There's very few of us that actually look at those sites. And and the time and the money that's in, involved. I mean, I I look at those excavations of whole whole houses excavated completely and anymore you know we could afford to do some tests yeah you know, and, three cubits and, by two cubits you know and that's it and a little remote sensing and, and yeah, we're done yeah <laughs> what's the probably the biggest uh besides the computers we talked about that but other other technological changes that have um have you ever done any of the stuff like with uh um, re food remnants and things inside pottery or uh, useware. Uh, yes, uh, we collected that data. We've uh, uh, scraped uh, pottery for uh, 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 radiocarbon dates. Where you know when it started out, there were people were using chunks of charcoal, uh, charcoal. Now it's just fragments that can be done with AMF dating. Yeah, that's a vast improvement, and it's relatively cheap, and the, the dates are. You can much more accurate. Yes, I, uh, we used to have to gather charcoal until you had had a big enough lump, and you know that the dates are all a little bit different on every yeah, one of those. Well, it's it's you know what are you, what were they collecting? They're just picking up stuff out of in the used to put them in a, in a, a baby food jar, collected them with a trowel, and seal them because they didn't want any any contamination. How long did they lay in the ground? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get contaminated. <laughs> There's all this great mythos about collecting radiocarbon dates. So anyway, that's changed. Um, another thing that's changed is uh, surveying. Uh, we started out, I was using, uh, Adrian taught us to use a, a plain table in Allidade that they'd had at the FIP site. <laughs> It was already an antique. I think it's setting up in Iowa Hall and exhibit, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's that old, but uh, uh, soon morphed into uh, transits, uh, which you can get much more precise measurements, but they're all mechanical. Everything now is electronic. I remember how long it took to, to try and get the it level. <laughs> and, and, and then get somebody the would leave. Setting over the point and get the, get the whole instrument level. And then uh, somebody would lean on it, and, and yeah, like, just, don't just, lean on the transit. <laughs> get over there! Oh man, it just drives me crazy. But it's, it's uh, the advantages of using that stuff is if you had a, a little bit of uh, trigonometry in high school, you could do it. it how many it? how many archaeology students today are trained with a, enough high school math to sit there and open up a table and figure out the cosine? <laughs> I, when I was teaching at lacrosse, a favorite um, refrain of some of the students was, oh, I'm math illiterate. And one of my colleagues would say, get out of here. <laughs> How do you expect to be an archaeologist? You can't do numbers. Got, got, to, got to know the math, too. Yeah. Uh, a sociologist yeah. colleague of mine, had a, had a, she had a T-shirt that said, uh, um, Anthropologists are sociologists that can't do math. <laughs> <laughs> Wanted that t-shirt. Wanted that t-shirt. Yeah. Anyway. But if you're in archaeology, you've got to know your numbers, your statistics. Everything is uh, right. So the uh, the field instrumentation is vastly improved. Uh, data collection is uh, like light years from what it used to be. You know. Mm -hmm. Probably be because you can deal with all those numbers now with a computer. Yep. In fact, uh, you can get a, a barcoding system. We had one at La Crosse where you could actually barcode stuff in. As it, I think uh, Bear Creek had the same thing. You bar, mm, yeah. barcode the data in as you're collecting it. You know, it's just a little dang. scanner. Yeah, pretty fast. You still have to wash it and catalog it, folks. But you know, it makes it. A lot <laughs> it makes but you it have to be careful how you wash it too. You don't want to get off all those residues on the inside of the pottery because that can be examined chemically now. Find uh, out what people were burning in their pots. <laughs> yeah, there's a one of the pots at Phipps has a uh, the image of a bison on it, 
and uh, it looks like a set of elk, elk antlers. That's the first painted image on a middle Missouri pot of which I'm aware. Yeah. Okay. And part of the problem with that is that when you're so busy collecting this stuff, no one ever really looks at what is there. Until I mean, they it, give it a good scrubbing. <laughs> yeah, well, and that's the other thing. Um, you know, sometimes with red slipping, they, they didn't really apply it, uh, cook it long enough. So if you could put it in water, you could wash it off. It all off. Yeah. <laughs> Where's the red slip pottery? It just went down the drain. You know? Yeah. How much of it might have been missed <laughs> over the years? So anyway, it's of interest to us. I don't know if it's interest to anybody out there, but it's a uh, interest to us. Yep. That's, that's what uh, archaeology is. It's, it's our own personal fan, <laughs> fascinations with. Several years ago, my, uh, Sister and aunt surprised me at a high school uh, alumni association banquet. Uh, the mother of a good friend of mine in high school, they're announcing the, the uh, you know, Distinguished Alumni Award. She, Alice gets some, as long as I've known this young man, he's always been interested in archaeology. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> She called you a young man. <laughs> well, I was to her. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way to go. Yeah, I, I actually collected a few pictures out of the archives. That, uh, uh oh, I had to cue Elizabeth to show Joe Tiffany in the Keys collection. <laughs> oh, this is this is going to be a Joe art story if it's the one I'm thinking of. No, 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 no. no, no. These are yes, no. yes, yes. It is. Uh, look closely at this picture. See my hand? Is oh, pointing, yes, pointing. that's right. That's the cursor. <laughs> a, a certain person we know by the name of Joe Arts captured that thing and made a cursor out of it. So he had a, me as a cursor pointing to where he wanted to. For pointing. years and years yes. on, on his computer, it, yeah. you with the cursor. And then there's a cutout of me of, of that image at the Plains Conference where I'd, I'd be pointing to the uh, registration desk or other things. Mm -hmm. That's what friends can do for you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the Plains archaeologists are known for silly people. Uh, Notice something else about that guy? You mean he doesn't have the, the, the silver mane? Or Why, <laughs> yes. I had dark brunette hair, if anybody cared to know. Let's... And that's the Keys Collection, isn't that it? That is the Keys Collection when it was set in the State Historical Society. Uh, so that's, that's a really cool. Got a grant uh, in the mid '70s from uh, National Endowment for the uh, the Arts, believe it or not, to uh, recurate the collection. Then we got a follow up grant from NSF to continue lo relocating sites that Keys had located and. We had the information we could track. We had down. all the letters and, and right. things from him. We uh, we got this whole collection together, recataloged it, put it in standardized boxes. It was it was quite the deal, you know. Anyway, and now a lot of people still can use it for research now too. That's they can yes, because we made uh, in addition to the like his archaeological record book, all that stuff was scanned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so all the letters uh, and, and notes and things. So it's all available for researchers. That was the whole goal of this thing, because this collection had been talked about, but really overlooked. And when Rupay was, Ray Rupay is a state archaeologist, his students did their MA work on uh, collection, Keys collection. So I'm glad it's back in the loop, because it's, it's uh, something I enjoyed. Um, I'm still fiddling around with it. Uh, a couple of articles I did in the journal are based on Keys collection sites, uh, the car site and uh, South Marble Rock Mound Group. Uh, just from having gone through the collection, went, hey, that's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, even, you know, when I, I show people through the archives, I always go to the Keys collection thing because that's there are like whole pots and things like that. And people can relate to that a lot better than when you show them a box full of crumbs. We uh, we started to relocate sites. Uh, we'd send out the, what happened to us? The, the DOT crew would take, you know, 
uh, some data and with her in a project area where a keys had reported a site and they had a few minutes, they go out and try to find it. Uh, one uh, field archaeologist stopped for lunch in this little town and says, anybody here have a place called Jerusalem Hill? Right over there. <laughs> we relocated another key site. <laughs> <laughs> score another so one. Score another one. Yeah. So. yeah. Well, it was always a lot of fun, too. I was going to cue Elizabeth to show the other site from, oh, I think okay. it's Chanyata with uh, the bison lurking in the, in the pit. <laughs> there he oh. is. That's uh, Dean Thompson, who will shoot me for telling you that, but it is. Where, uh, <laughs> uh, so you're with a bunch of college kids excavating all summer. There's some screwing around, not a great deal. Uh, but yeah, People uh, had fun. Uh, that's People, uh, we, we enjoyed ourselves. Worked hard. Uh, couldn't work that hard now. I know she has the, another shot. I, I brought a parachute, actual parachute. Oh, yeah. And uh, it was the shade. It was a shade. Uh, uh, set it up in the middle of the of the excavation, and people mm, travel around in the shade. It's very nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, because that's that's a lot of work on the planes. Is it's hot, <laughs> hot, <laughs> or oh, very cold? But usually cold. hot. <laughs> um, is there one, uh, Elizabeth? Do we have the one from the um, of Joe standing on a bucket, using it for a, as he took photos? There he is. Um. Uh, that's, uh, that's a relatively safe photograph. Uh, there's another one of Stephen Lenzik and I were out uh, trying to photograph uh, a cistern that was uh, excavated one season at uh, uh, Plum Grove. And, you know, Steve starts shining up this thing. The only thing holding it are, are guidelines. We're holding. That's the, the ladder? That yeah, the up. ladder. That's, I mean, that's terrifying. Around. Steve's out there diddly dinking around. Oh, you just get the photograph and get down. <laughs> <laughs> People are just holding the guy line. Yep. Yeah, no, I led, and there was another one that I didn't pull out of the archives, but it was just a mound of dirt for for standing on so all of the, the things we do to, to get up above and take a picture looking down on a... Well, now it's easy to do back to technology, easy to do now with the drone. Yeah, yeah. Didn't have drones then. Well, we had them, but no, we had a little do... airplane enthusiast had them. <laughs> <laughs> Taking our lives in our hands, <laughs> and perching on odd things in order to, to take photographs. Well, my other favorite one is the the IAS tour of Chanyata, um, just to prove that Joe has been involved in Iowa archaeology since forever. Uh, yes, nice hat, I, huh? <laughs> but uh, I'm, uh, well, what was I going to say? The, he's, wait, uh, he's waiting for the crowd to, to come. This was the first uh, Iowa Archaeological Society field school. Was oh, is it? it the, 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 so... So uh, it is a historic as well. Yeah. But see, that's that's the Plains influence. I was wearing a cowboy hat. <laughs> Nobody in Iowa wore a cowboy hat then. But they still don't. But, you know, <laughs> I had this old, old beat up uh, hat I wore. To, for protection from the sun. But I, I, one of the other things, I didn't pull the picture out, but I had a picture of you leading another IAS field trip at Whitrock just a couple of years ago in 2018. So you've been involved with IAS for? Since the dawn of time, yes. Uh, yeah. Well, not quite. Uh, the, Among uh, the founding members, probably. Yeah, no, that was Dr. Fisher and yeah. others who are long gone. Uh, but uh, when I joined, it was before, before Sean Young. I think I was in the late 60s. It's, it's been a while, folks. <laughs> 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 you know, but... Uh, that was just something something you did. Like when I went to Wisconsin, my mentor, Dr. Barris, said, well, you are a member of the Wisconsin Archaeological Society, aren't you? I am now. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, yes, sir. <laughs> Big grin on his face, you know. Yeah. But, uh, but education, reaching out to, to people, yeah, everybody's interested in archaeology. And I think the more opportunities we have to uh, get information, accurate information, to people, the better. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, uh, we sit around in an office, but uh, the uh, 
members of the society for years were the ones who were out in the field, finding sites, collecting data, reporting it in, uh, far more so than we were in, until the contract programs got going full gear. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot more coverage, but uh, uh, lots and lots of information based uh -huh. upon the work of the Iowa Archaeological Society. So, And that's why we're now having a, instituting the program of, of have a, a site surveyor and a, a, a people who can contact us and sort of take care of particular sites. That's something you know? uh, Len Alex and I did. We had a, a certification program. Yeah, and yeah. it's still going on. Um, so people can get some training and they can, uh, um, the people yes. will call us and tell us if, you know, a site has been damaged when they had all the floods out mm -hmm. west last year. Um, people were notifying us. They they knew of sites and they knew that sites had, were being damaged and were letting us know that uh, we need all, eyes on the ground, people who are concerned. Yeah, because we... Uh... Certainly, from even a central office like this or Iowa State, you can't get out. Yeah, you just don't have time to check all this stuff out. So, and just to drive vehicles and to pay field people to to do all that, it, it's <laughs> it runs into money really fast. Yes, it costs cash money and time and time and, and, time. Uh, and often isn't appreciated by the the uh, supporting institutions because they, you know, they just don't get this. Uh, yeah, it's not directly related to the function of the university. <laughs> I got an NSF grant uh, when I was at, for my graduate research at Wisconsin. The dean there was a mathematician and it took a long, hard discussion by the archaeology faculty to explain to him why I had to go into the field. <laughs> well, can you do this on a chalkboard? No. <laughs> Archaeology is kind of, by definition, oh my, in the field. <laughs> my gosh, you know. So anyway, just another adventure. <laughs> In education. That's right. Well, Elizabeth, I was going to say, uh, do you have any questions coming in from, from the outside? That uh... We have a lot of questions, actually. Okay. Uh -oh. So I guess. Yeah, Joe, are you ready? We'll come I ahead suppose. And do this. So Joe is um, just asking for a little bit of context about the US-34 project in Glenwood that you mentioned. So it was one of, if not the first big DOT funded highway projects, correct? And then what is the significance of the Glenwood locality? There is a couple of other uh, uh, DOT projects. Uh, uh, one was down on, on Lee County, but um, this is kind of a bittersweet, see, bittersweet story, folks. Uh, there were local collectors and DOT uh, road in, uh, inspectors who were amateur archaeologists. And they kind of pressured the DOT to let us excavate those lodges because they were interested in But yes, that was the first contract OSA ever signed for a Oh, yeah. cool. comprehensive archaeological work. Now, keep in mind, this is U.S., the last leg of U.S. 34 heading into uh, Nebraska. I-80 had already been built. I-29 was under construction. I-35 was already built. This much archaeology. So there's a dark side of that story. But the light side, what's the other thing Joe asked? What's the significance of the Glenwood locality? Oh my gosh, there's uh, 230, 40 lodges reported there. Uh, 18, I don't know, 30, I mean, 30 or more excavated by Ellison Orr and us. I mean, it uh, is phenomenal. This is an extension. Looks like your thumb sticking across the Missouri River. Extension of Earth Lodge culture in uh, eastern Nebraska and northern Kansas. And it just sits out there by itself. A little pioneering population moves into a couple of little river valleys and grows corn. No chickens, but I mean, <laughs> <laughs> hunted deer and the like. And it's uh, uh chickens. It is. Uh, there's really nothing like it in terms of the scope, except maybe Medicine Creek out in uh, West Central Nebraska uh, reservoir. There have been a, a few other large reservoir projects where. 
uh, Central Plains archaeology has been explored in at this depth, but still they have not been reported at the level that this will be reported when it's eventually done. So, And it, it's so different from things like the Mill Creek and, and yeah. oneotocytes. It, it's totally different phenomenon that was coexisting. Yeah, well, not quite co coexisting, but different. You know, here's Mill Creek. They're all hunkered down behind their, their fortified walls. and Yeah, teachers crammed together. <laughs> glowering at each other. Here's the Glenwood folks out there, you know. Spread uh, out. Spread <laughs> out, little farmsteads, uh, having a good time, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Right. No and these, the, all these cultures you're mentioning, just for context, are roughly 800 to 1,000 years old, give or yeah, take. Yeah, 12. Yeah, that's good enough. Yeah. <laughs> all right, next Project. question. What did you do for your master's and PhD theses? What did I do? The master's thesis was the uh, analysis of seeds from um, the Broglie Rock Shelter. Uh, 47 GT 156, Grant County. Anyway, it uh, was a site that was excavated uh, and only recently has even gotten written up. But uh, the seeds were nicely stratified between woodland archaic and you could tell when the uh, late prehistoric people came because that's there's a rise of corn. Corn was present. <laughs> so that was my MA project, working on seeds like... Uh, Bill Green and Dave Ben and others who we all went to Wisconsin, which is probably <laughs> scare scare a lot of people. Uh, the dissertation was a Chanyana site. Uh, we've talked about. So you've mentioned Chanyata, but for context, what? How old is Chanyata? Where is it? Uh, it's slightly older than me. Uh, it's in uh, Buena Vista. Buena Vista Buena County. Buena Vista. Or Buena Vista, you know. <laughs> For Iowans who don't know, that's a very famous battle site in the Mexican War. Many towns in Iowa are named after Mexican war sites. The veterans, that. <laughs> veterans came here, you know. Cerro Gordo, another big battle site. Battle you know. site. Huh. Anyway, Buena Vista, <laughs> Chaniata is uh, on a little stream that runs north into uh, the Little Sioux, and it is way up there. Uh, in the northern part of Buena Vista County, about 25, 27 miles north of Storm Lake is where it's located. This site uh, is set on a high outwash plain. It's basically the uh, upland compared to everything else around it. Um, about uh, 1200 AD, uh, they weren't there very long, but what was nice about it is the site was in a pasture and it had never been plowed. All yeah. these other Mill Creek sites, we're talking about Phipps, Acres, all of them are down the floodplain and have been uh, carried away. So it's so, like- So they're all churned up too. Except yeah. for Whit Rock, which was a state preserve in Chanyana, which is sitting up there in a pasture. So we could actually examine uh, where the houses were built, how they're laid out, how they're constructed, uh, the relationship among the houses, a lot of stuff you can't really do on, on the big midden sites. Uh, one of the houses we dug, we came down on it, and uh, there's all these charred rafters, which isn't news to anybody. You know, if any, you find houses, they burn. But on this one, above the rafters, you could see a thin line of crumbly, uh, burnt earth. It was the, the earth cover. The covering. Covering the, the rafters and uh, thatch that formed the roof pieces of daub, you know, like uh, with the print of the thatch on the inside. inside sitting there. And at the time we went, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Little I know I'd never see that again <laughs> <laughs> with that kind of kind of preservation. So that was a dissertation site, uh, John Yana. Still there, still worth going to see if you know where to find it. Another field trip. <laughs> Another field trip. All right, Lynn, Alex is asking a couple questions. So particular uh -oh. individuals near or far who mentored or inspired you? Individuals near or far who mentored or inspired me? Well, that's a good question, Lynn. Um, Adrian D. Anderson, who was the assistant state archeologist, was basically my mentor here in archeology. span uh, To some degree, Mac McCusick, who was a state archeologist, and one of my instructors who's still around, Holmes Simpkin, <laughs> believe it or not. So uh, He's always been an inspiration to me, too. 
And while I was growing up in archaeology, archaeology, I knew this grad student at Wisconsin by the name of Bob Alex. So <laughs> Bob and I bummed around a lot, um, visited sites, uh, did all kinds of things. But um, what was the other part of that question? Oh, I got to Wisconsin. Yes, sorry, Lynn. Got to Wisconsin. Of course, uh, my mentor there was the late David Barris, who was uh, – one of the great uh, archaeologists of that era with uh, Imolari and uh, a whole gaggle of Jimmy Griffin. He was of that uh, vintage, but uh, went to Columbia, um, was uh, where uh, William Duncan Strong, another great Plains. That's another big name. That's uh, so what he studied under. Uh, and his connections, his grad student buddies are Carlisle Smith at Kansas. You know, just it was a different crowd of people. But uh, uh, Barris taught me a lot. He was he was a big picture. He look out across the plains and try and well a do lot the of, whole story. A lot of people who were his students <laughs> were, were afraid of him, and I thought he was a funny guy. Anyway. <laughs> uh, Things you know, we sit around the lab, and David would walk in. Uh, We're going to uh, Madison Club tonight. Bring a tie. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you take so many plains archaeologists who wear ties. <laughs> ties but this is the uh, Madison Club, so we had to wear wear a tie. Uh, anyway, funny guy. Enjoyed him immensely. Uh, he had taught himself. Um, uh, how to be a malacologist, identify snails. Hmm. Well, in uh, his years as an archaeologist, and that's what he's most remembered for now. It's not the archaeology he did at Spiro or other places. So, Another well, question from Lynn. It sounds like an inside story, but she's wondering about your most harrowing story from an excavation. Possibly yeah. something that happened in Mills County? Oh, my God. Besides teetering on the ladder, trying to take pictures. Uh, can these stories be shared? I don't know. <laughs> Lynn, you're going to have to give me a hint what you're after. And then I'll, because there's a, there's, there's just some stuff we can't share. <laughs> Maybe she'll, she'll chime in with a follow up to that. Yeah. Dealt with rattlesnakes and uh, tarantulas and. Uh, not so uh, much. Other, uh, more in California. Uh, that's my, where I put the tarantulas. Yeah. Yeah, tarantulas. Uh, my out walking in the Sierra, uh, California foothills around Los Angeles. My younger daughter goes, "Oh, look, trail spider is a tarantula." You know, had to hold the dog so it didn't follow a rattlesnake, uh, western brown rattler into the manzanita bushes. You know, because the dog was <laughs> no, no puppy. But my, if you have to know my daughter, she'd have, she'd have walked in there and got the snake. If I <laughs> so, anyway, many adventures. Uh, most of them are, of, well, they're not all raucous, but they relate to young people working on archaeological sites. And you can imagine what that's like if you're an old person now, <laughs> a bunch of 20 year olds. Uh, anyway. I'm trying to think of the name of the bar in central North Dakota. Uh, With the Oliver, Oliver site? I mean, Oliver, North Dakota, the county seat? No, it was uh, Lemur and uh, his crew. Ah. That's one of the places we went to, 40 mile drive for. Um, then there's a wash, there's a tavern in Washburn also. Yeah, that's the one I was thinking of, yeah. and I don't know why I'm blanking on the name of it, but I even have a t-shirt from there. Well, I'll tell you how this works. When we were there, um, the only way beer got to North Dakota was in in uh, bottles, because there wasn't any oh, breweries. Right. So, Blue Laws. Everybody drank whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> so, I like I like a whiskey, and they set down a John Wayne, you know, eight-ounce tumbler, and... <laughs> For that thing about 50 cents. <laughs> so Lynn has a, has a follow up. Okay. She says, a, a Mills County fellow in a storage pit oh. as a road grader is about to grade over. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Lynn. 
<laughs> another great, another great adventure. Uh, we were at a, a site that uh, uh, inmate, and you know, I don't say inmates, uh, patients at uh, the Glenwood School had dug in the 1930s ML 120, and we re-excavated that and located it. In the process of that, Anton Till and I were out along the right of way, coring with a, a post tow logger in the back of a of a Ford tractor trying to locate sites. There is an area where there was four of our auger holes. Sorry, folks. If you, you it's fine. Train. It's fine, yeah. <laughs> About, I don't know, 100 yards from uh, the site we were working on. There's four auger holes. They scraped over it right in the middle was a lodge. <laughs> <laughs> the best sampling technique ever. Missed it. Anyway. The DOT uh, foreman gave us a day to excavate it. We need that land. So get out there. And, so we, we work night and day, all night. I was going to say, I saw those pictures with the lanterns, people excavating me, uh, by lantern light. Me and Larry Zerman and the usual suspects. Uh, Daryl Fulmer is the one that Lynn's talking about. We're in the process of doing the final mapping. Uh, Daryl is uh, uh, cleaning out a storage pit. And one of the push cats went right through the site. <laughs> and Daryl happened to look up quickly and ducked down in that storage pit or he had been crushed. The thing went right over the top of it. Jeez. <laughs> Just another day on the job. Wow. Uh, <laughs> Good thing that they left a deep storage pit. <laughs> uh, I used to, I still do when we talk about Glenwood, show pictures of the pre-OSHA days. Everyone's out there bareback, no sun, tan lotion, no helm, no hard hats, no nothing. You know, just standing around, working around equipment, buzzing by. and <laughs> Seemed natural. <laughs> <laughs> it's very dangerous. So. Yeah, Thanks, Lane. That, that was a funny story. Yeah. <laughs> Here's a, a Wisconsin question. Oh, boy. Uh, did you start with the findings of Mississippi and Cahokia-related sites around Trempolo if uh, that is, since you were in La Crosse, what are your thoughts on it all? Uh, those sites were uh, well known. Uh, I was actually packing up when they began the, the most recent uh, excavations in the Trempolo area. But uh, there is a, a Mississippian conclave there, uh, a site that Bob Alex worked on uh, called Diamond, Diamond Bluff on the other, uh, the Marrow site. Uh, also, Mississippian artifacts with Mill Creek pottery. Uh, it's just very cool. It's a, it's a, I didn't wander up there. And, um, the, it is one of several, not many, uh, uh, site unit intrusions by Mississippians in, uh, in Wisconsin. Most people are familiar with Astalan, but uh, this bunch kind of drizzled in from south of uh, La Crosse in the Stoughton area. And ended up in Trempolo. Uh but you know, wall trench houses, the whole the whole shtick. Plus uh, the water tower, the old water tower in Trempolo used to sit on top of a platform mound. Really? It's pretty nice. But uh the uh one of the sites I worked on a field school at the time, uh, just north of La Crosse in Alaska, uh found a, a big uh red slipped uh early Mississippian pot shirt. Also uh, several, well, not several, one small uh, ramming sized pot, but the stuff is out there. Just kind of scattered yeah. along like a cookie crumb trail as they're heading, <laughs> heading, up, <laughs> heading up the valley, you know? So it's, and, it's pretty neat. But yeah, I, I got to uh, kind of work indirectly on some of that, but. Uh, and that's pretty cool. I wonder what they thought when they got their first big winter up there. <laughs> Boy, that's a lot warmer in St. Louis. That's yeah, what that's what back to St. Louis, guys. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Whose idea was this migration? <laughs> uh, so that's a good question, though. But the, the, the Mississippi and Mill Creek uh, connections always fascinated me. Uh, yeah. One of the things uh, I, I did on a research paper is there is Mill Creek pottery at every site except Astalan. There's Mill Creek pottery in downtown Cahokia. I mean, it's it's amazing how far and wide right. they got. Uh, so there hasn't been that much work done at Astalan, has there? Um, uh, only about thirty years. Oh, really? Has there been a? Yeah, 
there's a lot. There's a lot, yes. There's a lot out there. Here's uh, a, a general question from John. Please talk about your perspectives on the development from the 1970s to present in Iowa of increasing collaboration with American Indians concerning both ancestral remains and artifacts. Yep. And Sheree is temporarily, we've been having some technical issues today. Um, she'll hopefully be back in a second. Uh, glad you asked that, John. One of the US 34 sites was 13 ML 126. Uh, nice little, not little, it's a pretty good size Glenwood Earth Lodge. Years later, a historic pioneer cemetery was built, in, uh, excavated into it. Uh, so we get there, uh, it's like, wow, the locals were very upset because they had relatives that were buried in the cemetery, but the tombstones had been kicked off, not by us, but dumped in a local ravine. So uh, they had gotten a court order with a big backhoe coming out there, and the locals looked at this, looked at us. We want them to dig this. So the archaeologist <laughs> <laughs> excavated the cemetery. Uh, and one of the individuals in that cemetery was a young Indian woman, uh, beadwork and other things buried with her. Uh, at the time, the state archaeologist, because that's what you did with stuff like this, hauled it back to Iowa City. Well, Maria Pearson, who many of you do not know, but a lot of us did, a very important person in archaeology and uh, Indian affairs and Indian awareness, um, put on her Indian garb, as she said, walked into Governor's, Governor Ray's office and said, uh, are you the chief? And he said, yes, I am. <laughs> 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 anyway, the bones went back. Let's put it that way. And that was the beginning of uh, this somewhat a rocky relationship, but uh, a working Iowa archaeologists working with the Native American community, first with, you know, unmitigated disasters, but as it, it, it got more systemized, uh, Dwayne Anderson set up a, a board, a Native American advisory board, because he had the responsibility to still disinter uh, human remains. But there were, nobody's going to do that anymore without talking to people who might have some interest in it. So uh, stuff that folks may take for granted now uh, really came out of Glenwood and a couple of other uh, salvage sites. Another one was Siouxland Sand and Gravel Site, which was a uh, earth quarry in the Lus Hills above North Sioux City. Another story. Anyway, um, but uh, that symbiosis between mainly Maria, Duane, uh, Dave Gradwell, uh, there's a list of the usual suspects, but uh, who have always always had an interest in archaeology, but also an interest in people mm -hmm. and, and ecology, <laughs> and and what those people were interested in. So uh, now uh, people may just take it for granted that uh, uh, this has always occurred, and it is not it is not so. So it didn't really start till 1970. And Iowa was way ahead of the curve. On the national scene, it didn't start yeah. until the 90s. Yeah, only Maine had a state law, and we were like the second or third state law uh, protecting Native American, well, burials older than 150 years old or older. Uh, we're put under the purview of the state archaeologist. So, uh, and at the time, this was like a political athema, just poison. I watched my colleague, Larry Zerman, be humiliated, humiliated at a conference by a professional archaeologist. Just, I'm surprised he ever went back to another meeting with him. Uh, just no sense. No sense. Well, it's mine. And we're going to do it. And we're scientists. Well, that may be, but that doesn't mean you don't take into consideration <laughs> other people's feelings, for crying out loud. Uh, so, <laughs> people whose cultures we're studying. <laughs> people whose cultures we're studying, uh, trying to learn more. I mean, it was like the old rotary thing. How do you build goodwill and better friendships if you don't talk to people? <laughs> we'll anyway. take uh, just we'll just do three more questions because uh, there's a whole slew here. This is sort of a general one, and we talked about the the buffalo on the pot, which I'll link a picture of. But any other evidence of drawing on 
artifacts in Northwest Iowa? Uh, there are, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> there's um, some uh, uh, pictographs, some rock art here and there, but it's it's scarce as hen teeth in Northeast, Northeast Iowa. That's way different. Lots of caves, lots of oh, it's work. places it's, where it's protected. And what's it protected? And, and, uh, work be worked. Uh, so what makes this interesting in Northwest Iowa, I'm losing my voice, uh, is not only is there evidence of the artwork, they also made uh, little uh, catlinite critters. Uh, yeah, the tablets and the... Uh, the tablets, you want to go to tablets? So it's not like there wasn't artwork out there and imagery that it was about their view of the cosmos and how it relate to it, but... To have something painted on a pot was just incredible. It is really incredible. I know we do have a, a photo in our Facebook photo albums, but I will relink that for the people who are interested. Um, one more question from Lynn Alex. If you could oh. have a, a wish granted to know <laughs> to know one thing in archaeology before it's all over, what would it be? Who were my Neanderthal relatives? <laughs> No, I, uh, there's a lot of stuff. Um, when you're in archaeology, you might work on the plains, but you have lots of other interests and other kinds of archaeology. So um, there are finds going on now in uh, Stonehenge, for example, uh, when they used uh, LIDAR imagery, uh, found storage pits, burials they didn't know were there, roadways, all this stuff is like, it's amazing to me. You know, uh, where would I start? I don't know. <laughs> uh, I'm probably beyond the Oneyota, but you never know. You can go back to another Oneyota site. Uh, so Lynn wanted to know one again. Yeah. Why I'm well, still talking. <laughs> <laughs> if you could have one, a wish granted to know one thing about archaeology. One thing about archaeology. If you don't go to... into it, kids. Scary. <laughs> Don't go into it. The word from on high, you know, did, 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 we, did we guess right about something? <laughs> oh, we always guess right. We ask ourselves, we pat ourselves in the back. Well, I was right about that, of course, you know, 100% <laughs> right in hindsight. But uh, And we're always willing to change our mind with more that's data. That's right. <laughs> but uh, archaeology is a very interesting discipline. It's, it's cross-disciplinary nature. I was almost a geologist for a while, and I... I might have done that anyway, but uh, Joe Wan, for example, has kept up far more interest in geomorphology and soils than I did. But I mean, that's the kind of stuff you can get into. I don't know of any other discipline that can draw in this cadre of people with of a wide variety of interests uh, and all be talking about the same thing. That's my botcher. <laughs> no, it's mine. <laughs> I found that. No. So I hope that answers Lynn's question. If it doesn't, she'll discuss it with me later. I'm sure. <laughs> so uh, one last question, um, sort of a long one, but not. So Rebecca is basically pointing out how modified by humans Iowa is, especially in the last century. So what might future excavations uncover that perhaps haven't been discovered by existing projects so far? So what remains out there to be seen in Iowa, despite it being so heavily modified? Uh, Iowa is one of the famous terraform Midwestern states, Ohio, Iowa, <laughs> Indiana, plowed away. That's, that's the general impression you get, but actually it's still all there, okay? The sites that have been plowed, if they had any uh, deep stratigraphy, that's, that's up to the surface now, but it's still, still there. We worked on a site last fall a Mill Creek site that had been absolutely discombobulated by a flood, wiped out, uh, site scoured clean. You know, you'd think, what? Well, and the uh, criminy is left. Well, there's a lot left. Uh, we went out uh, using uh, modern instrumentation and relocated how many? 80 features? A lot. Bison bones, uh, it was just remarkable what can be recovered off a site that had been basically destroyed when the, the levee was built to protect the field it was in. But the site was still there. Now, not every site's going to come up like that, but 
you just can't uniformly write anything off until you look at it. And uh, to me, that's kind of exciting after talking about Stonehenge. That's 5,000 years old. They're still finding stuff out there that have been, uh, it's there. Uh, we can find things uh, with uh, LIDAR imagery, um, fortifications, a McKinney, McKinney site, other places that all you see today is a plowed field. Yeah, there, there's a lot out there. To there's a there. lot out there, uh, even in a terraform state like Iowa. <laughs> that's kind of the advantage of all of the kind of remote sensing things that we can do now. Yes, is, all is the stuff that's... A, we can a, detect things way down deep. So we've just, we've gone over an hour. So I apologize if we didn't get to your question. I will share your questions with Joe and Cherie and share all of your hellos as well. So right now I'll just say thank you for tuning in again. And we'll be back next week with Mike Perry and Brennan Dolan. Hey, I gotta get in and sneak in on Mike's talk. Just, just <laughs> <laughs> and we're signing off. I hired him just so you know. Yeah. <laughs>